and we are up and running. Welcome everybody to the July 13 Propeller Live Forum. We don't have a set presentation for today, but of course we'll have an update from Chip. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, the incredible amount of work that is taking uh, to just keep the products in inventory. Uh, we have been spending hundreds of hours uh, getting components, sometimes replacement components, redesigning PCBs. So you will notice if you go to the to order, let's say the um, propeller to um, the easy board or the 32 megabytes one, sometimes you will notice that the, the revision keeps increasing. And that's because sometimes, sometimes we can do a drop-in replacement, but sometimes we need to redesign a section of section of the PCB, which triggers that we need to keep increasing the, the, the letters. So right now it's, uh, it's a strange, but this week we finally got to the point that we have all the parts and all the PCBs, everything in place, and we are finally running the, the pick and place machine a little uh, more smoothly. Sometimes we do have to run uh, some inefficient uh, short maybe 50 boards that we don't like to do that. You need to set up the machine. It takes a lot of work to just set up the machine for, for 50 boards. And sometimes we need to do that. So there's just a lot of work behind the scenes. So when you go to the website and click in the, in the shop area, you see the boards are there. Well, it was not easy to keep them there uh, during this supply chain uh, shortage. So, but we are doing good now. And uh, the propeller chips also, propeller one, propeller two are in inventory. We are receiving uh, next week about 13,000 propeller ones that are going to testing. So things are still in the pipeline and a little smoother at Parallax these days. Uh, so today we have an update from Chip uh, on the debugger and maybe some other things. So Chip, I pass it to you. All right. Let's see here. Uh, okay, so I'm going to take over screen sharing, right? So let's see here. Um, oh, here we are. Okay, so here's a little program. You guys can probably see this okay. Yep. Okay, so two programs are going to run when this executes, right? There's going to be uh, this here, some spin code that just runs in a loop. It just increments eight, uh, it pins zero through seven. And uh, this launches a little PASM cog to run this code here. And so this is going to start up two debugger windows. Uh, one is going to be running a PASM program. One's going to be running the... the uh, the spin code. So I'll hit control F10 to run this and let me expand this a little bit. I have two windows going here. Let me move. Uh, this is the top program. The interpreted program is in here. And I don't know where this was last time. I think I had these down in the corner, but I've got all this stuff worked out. Can you see at the bottom? There's like hints that pop up as I move around. So That's this not kind of makes it easy that i mean it's pretty self-explanatory this thing is as you move around uh the hints tell you what you can do um the hints, they are not showing cheap on this side do you see them at the bottom of the window well, if, if it's in the hub line there we can see them yeah yeah this this is the hub this is a tab that that says this is the hub but this little window down in here stuff appears in right so as i move around Tells me what'll happen if I click and what the meaning of things are. So this is the interpreter that's running here. You can see that X bytes enabled. Well, if I go here, it tells me that the X byte mode, it's an eight bit mode. It's compressed for A, you know, AO to FF, C and Z are affected. So I did a thing where with this little hint window, it allowed for a lot of nice elaboration on things that would be too hard to express all at once in that little box up there. But anyway, you can select, um, 
you know, what you want to break on. These are all your breakpoint sources. And right now it's just mutually exclusive. You press select one, you know, any of them, but it's just one at a time. But the hardware is capable. I might make it so that if you, if you left click now, it picks the one you want, but I might make it so that if it right clicks, it just toggles that option off and on. So you can actually have multiple break conditions. But right now it's just, it's just one. Um, if I, we can see where we are right here. Whoops. Let's see. Um, okay. So right now we're the, the thing broke at, at uh, two, three, six. If I go to main, I can then single step. I've got to fix this scroll thing. That's not right. I was up late last night working on this. Anyway, you can see uh, instructions that will be skipped. And I, there is a break instruction here. If I hit, if I say just uh, break on debug, this is going to look, the disassembly looks the same every time because it's breaking at the same point in the program. But I could hit auto here and it will automate those breakpoints. I can also switch to like main single stepping and it will single step through everything and show you where you are in the cog, you know, in the reg or the LUT memory. What does, um, what does auto actually mean there in that sense? Just so next is like single step, right? Auto means just repeat. So it just kind of animates as if you're clicking step over and over or as if you're clicking next over and over. So it's kind of a slow motion run. Basically. Yes. Yes. I don't know if it's really, it's a little too fast to watch what's happening, but it might be useful for some things, but I thought it'd be good to be able to have some animating because you can watch, like if you look in the LUT and the reg, you can see, you know, where it's running. Is it possible to, to create a breakpoint? Like if uh, this value in the LUT changes at all, or if it changes to this break, is that something like it's, that possible? It's not, you'd have to, because all we have are in hardware are these things here. We can break on an interrupt entry or the main or the interrupt code. We can hit use an address breakpoint or any main instruction. We can break on an event. Like, see, I can say QMT and click that, and it would only. But that that event's never happening, right? So, so it has a thing. Uh, you can just do an asynchronous break, and it'll just tell you where it was. And I can just say, okay, whoops. Maybe go back to here and just auto. To set a breakpoint, you know, to use this, it's never going to hit zero. Um, but let's see. Let me let me bring the other window in here. This is the smaller program we had, right? The little little uh, the the um, PASM program. Uh, it has a break. Okay, let's see. So I'll go to single step and. Uh, this break pound zero up here. This is actually this actually means go into the debugger. If that were break one through FF, that would mean do a debug message for like a uh, a plot window or something like that, or just a general message to the console down. You know this this thing here. Um, but if we single step this little program here, this is going to do a wait. It's randomly writing hub memory and then. It's adding to 100, 101, 102, 103 loops back. I can just have it repeat. So you see these little registers up here? It notices when things are changing in the cog registers and it keeps track of changed registers. You can click this at any time to reset it and it will you know, start keeping a new list. So as your code executes, anything that uh, changes gets shown to you right here. And it prioritizes everything. So if something is it neat, if it's something just changed and there's something and the list is full, but there's something on that list that hasn't changed in the longest time, it'll swap that out with the new with the new value. So because it's important to know what's changed as you execute. And see, this this is not a symbolic debugger at this point. It's purely, you know, binary. It's just looking at registers, it's disassembling just from machine language to kind of you know, raw assembly. Uh, and to set a breakpoint, like if I want to break on this instruction here, I can right click it and that'll set 
the breakpoint to eight and enable it. So if I say next, if I keep hitting next, it just keeps showing us what happened after it hit the breakpoint. I can hit auto, and then it will just, um, you know, every time it gets a break, every time it hits that breakpoint, it updates the display and then re-executes. So this is actually something that the auto is useful for because single stepping happens too quickly through code. But if you want to cycle through breakpoints and see what's changing where, this is useful. You can also, uh, like we see that these are changing here. I could go down to here and just click on this and then it will just stay there. So we can, we can rather than show our code executing, it will just lock on that section of registers and show us those values, which are also up in here, right? What's happening in the bottom right? It looks like uh, pixels ah. are starting and then fading. What's, what is that? Okay, so the program here is randomly writing data. Well, it, to, it's, randomly picking addresses and writing data to the hub memory. So it's, it's writing the value in 100 to some random location. So here it, uh, it's, it's getting the uh, a random value into pointer A. Here it's writing 100 to where that thing points. And here it's doing, I think a delay, of maybe a hundredth of a second or something. So what's happening down here is this is like a heat map showing where the changes are in the entire 512K of hub memory. So if we like go to one of these dots here and click it, let's see. Okay, there, see that guy had changed at one point. See where it says DD? So as your program runs, it's going to be affecting hub memory. Um, in fact, let's do this. Let's get go back to this window, actually back to the source. And I'll, uh, let's see, here we are. I'll not launch this other program. So we're just gonna run the spin code, right? This is all that's gonna execute right here. So it's gonna hit a debug interrupt each time through the loop. So control F10, I'll run that. And uh, here we are. Um, let's see. Okay, so now we're running the interpreter. And let's say we just want to keep tripping on that debug thing, that'll be faster. So right here, you can see that little yellow. There we are, I can click on that and hold it there. So we are seeing now what's changing in hub. So it kind of brings it brings your focus to where things are getting affected in hub memory, because there's a lot of it. And uh, you know, depending on whether you're running spin, you have some stack activity like this, or if you're doing some graphics, you're gonna see a lot of changes all the time, but it just helps you find where the action is. And then if I click here, it'll go back to this kind of display. And if I single step, these dots are gonna, you know, light up only periodically as it loops and changes something on the stack. Right there, it's changing that to 23 next. Any questions about this or comments or requests? I mean, the obvious one is to import labels from the compiler. Yes. Because have a, being able to see the memory is not very useful if you don't know what's going on. Right. Especially if you I have know. a spin program, you may not even be terribly aware of how everything's laid out in memory. Right. I don't, you know, it's, it's not a sure thing to contextualize what's happening to any particular uh, source code because you could have self-modifying code, you could have overlays, all kinds of things could be happening that could cause a lot of misrepresentations in the distance. Yeah, I mean, you could, but in those cases, you could just not. Whereas um, in most cases you do have a particular thing at a particular address. Right. Yeah. In most cases you do, but it, it, but what I'm thinking the way I'll handle that is I'll allow for, um, at least for a first pass so that you can give it a list of, uh, labels, right. And it will use those in the disassembly and, uh, it'll let you see things by name, but 
I think it's going to work best if you if you pick a limited number of labels that are of interest to you and then use those rather than pull in everything because it'll be overdoing it. It'll it'll be putting labels on things that you know aren't really what what they appear to be. Um, so how would you feel about that? Like having yeah, just being able to select the labels uh, that are interesting. Usually, yeah. you know, don't want to look at everything. You just want to look at particular thing. For example, I have, um, I've, I've, ha I've been having some funny thing with the audio registers in uh, Neo Yuma. Something, something's weirds going on with them. Um, so, my, so I would have would maybe put those. Um, want to watch those on the hub and see when they get changed. Right. Because something might just be writing over them or something. Yeah. Very strange things uh, occur of that. Well, it may also be some sort of actual issue where it, it takes the intended right path, but just price garbage, I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing in this architecture because we don't have like ROM programs. We have programs that are totally dynamic and it's, uh, it's not clear. Like I've thought a lot about this and trying to use some kind of like algorithm to sort of figure out what the most likely fit is for your code back to your source mm -hmm. code and use labels on those bases. But I don't know if that's usually if it gets that complex, it's not the best solution. I'm kind of thinking now because this is like a very low level debugger. If anyone wants to use this thing, they have to kind of know something about assembly language. So I think giving them like you know, a budget of so many, you know, labels that tend to be smaller in name would, uh, would suffice for debugging and wouldn't create a big mess. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, the actual label. You could say this is the one it, because you have a layout issue because um, when the label is too long. Actually, is there a maximum length on labels? Is there any limitation? 32 characters. But see, in this little window, I don't want to have to like expand everything for the worst case all the time because it would uh, it would just take a lot of screen space and I and I don't I, I'm using a mono spaced. Well, we kind of need a mono spaced font, but. Could you use maybe tooltips or something like just have a, a little indicator to show that there's a label here and if you float the mouse over it. Some it's... sort of ellipsis thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, issues. yeah. you know, uh, now that would be pretty easy. I mean, something where if you touch 1D4, it tells you what the name is. Uh, that, that, then, you're, then it kind of reverses the, uh, the query, which is better because it's not automatically doing the wrong, it, it's not going to automatically do what could be the wrong thing. You might say one, you might point to 1D4 and it could give you a list of like a bunch of stuff that compiled to 1D4. Yeah, and, and if then, you just if you just had some sort of indicator like a box around it or something that indicated that there's more info here if you float, that would be helpful. Yeah, that, that I could see that. Yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I'm kind of thinking like the way I would use something like this is I would have maybe max this is the kind of thing some people would hate, but I'd say like, okay, you've got a bunch of names you can enter in for locations, but you're limited to maybe four characters, you know, which is enough to get, get away from this mystery. Like what's, what's at 1D4 and what's 1D5, but it would be kind of, it would conserve on screen space because things could get big and sloppy quick, but reversing it, like you said, would help help that, but it still doesn't let you see at a glance. Or you could press a key to switch between numeric display like this and like label display. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually, yeah. And with the label display, you could have it show just the first three letters unless you float the mouse and then it extends to the right and shows the full label. Oh yeah. 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 That would be good. That would, that would kind of solve a problem. Um, yeah, I like that idea. This this thing's gonna evolve a lot, I think. And how, uh, oh, sorry, just wondering how we would get the label addresses into the debugger. 
We would have to have some kind of um, syntax for that when you issue the debug statement. So are we integrating the debugger with peanut then? Is yeah, right now it's in peanut, but anything I do here will automatically flow into the propeller tool. Well, I'm just wondering about other languages, like, you know, how someone could debug a C program, maybe. Ah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it becomes, it's like this, I've been playing around with this thing for months, you know, this is one of those things that could like go so many directions and it's hard to wrap up. I, it's, I spent a lot of time just kind of distilling this format, trying to make it so that, okay, on each breakpoint, you can see all changes in hub memory. You're notified where they were. So that's a value because 512k bytes is a lot of space. So this little thing does that. And then here's a breakdown of the pins. Here's some pointer stuff, registers that are changing, you know, a bitmap of the LUT memory. It's like a literal bitmap of the bits. So here's a lookup table, here's some code. This is empty here. So. By I, the way, by the way, is this currently integrated into the propeller tool or is this a separate standalone debugger? Right now it's, I'm running it in my version of peanut. So pretty soon I'll release a new version of peanut. I'll put it on the forums and then probably, you know, once it's good, a few days later, we'll, we'll put it into the propeller tool. So currently the propeller tool doesn't have this at all. No, okay. no. Yeah, this is something that's been brewing slowly. I'm very excited about this because uh, I'm, I'm, an I'm very comfortable with assembly language. So being able to do this is just, is like a whole new world for me. Good, yeah. I mean, my, my, the, what I was really thinking a lot about was, you know, it's a mystery when you're programming something. You don't, you don't know what the boundaries are in all this, but this thing shows you the boundaries. Like this is all of my reg space. This is all of my let space. You know, here are the special registers in reg space. Here are all the events. Uh, here are some pointers. Here's the stack. I mean, everything that can be shown right here is shown. I mean, this is the, everything the hardware affords in debugging is being shown right here. And it's all kind of, I try to make it compact, but if you can see everything at once, it's helpful because it's, it's just always good to see like visually, you know, how much room have I got left? And um, you know, what's, what's my code looking like when it executes? And does, it, does it cost any cycles uh, to be, you know, providing all this debug information? Like if, if you hit run, is it running at full speed or is it slower because it's- No, so, okay, so, I have this, D, I'm, I'm breaking on debug, right? Right here. Okay, here's breaking on single instruction. So this way it's, it's with every instruction, it stops and it reports. It does another data dump, updates the display, and then goes and does the next instruction. But when you do like debug, it's only breaking when it gets to the debug. So everything in between is running at full speed without any interruption at all. So the breaks like, you know, main means break on every instruction. This means break on int one entry. Um, oh, and I got a stack here because I don't have another cog. In order to bust a cog out of like something like this where it's running, we're waiting for something that's not happening right now because I don't have any interrupts, right? So this hint says to force an async break in this cog, another cog must be idling and debug. So the you have to have some cog's attention to go tell the other cog hey, to create a break in the other cog. So if I uncomment this thing again and run this, now I've got, I've got two debug windows running. Let's see. Oh boy, this is, let's see. So if I tell it to do something impossible, it this time allows me to break because I do have another cog idling. So. This is all peer to peer, you know, there's no central cog doing debug. Each cog that's doing a debug interrupt is having its own conversation with the host PC. But if one is off in the weeds and you wanna do an asynchronous break, you gotta have some other cog idling in the debugger that it can tell, okay, hey, uh, use this mask and generate a bunch of asynchronous breaks. So that's how you break other cogs if, if, they're, if they're not responding to breakpoints. So I have, you know, an additional uh, debug window 
which I, it's funny, I don't see it. Once we run this uh, Zoom stuff in the screen share, my computer starts behaving a little weird. So I don't see the other debug screen, but it's there because if I say next, it, it does allow me to break. And then it tells me where I am. So every time we, we do this, we wind up at a different place because it told us, okay, this is where we are now. So we've now done an asynchronous break and we're at this instruction. So if I single step this, it's going to execute another X byte. See, X byte's all enabled, and uh, because one FF is on the stack, so when we hit next instruction, it's now in the next bytecode execution. Or we can just break on the debug. Does that all make sense? So wait, you said it's in the. It's in the bytecode execution. So does next step through the bytecode interpreter or does oh, it? Oh yeah, yeah, stop? watch this. If we go, well, just to me, okay, I'll stop it, right? So wait until we have a return instruction. So I'll step, okay, there, you see that return right there? And you see how we got one FF on the stack? Yeah. And we've, we've got this little orange check. That means we're ready to go. So when this return executes, it's going to fetch this byte right here. Uh, Point, no, actually, no, this byte, it's the, it's the RF read fast. It's gonna grab 44, which is a byte code, and it's gonna pick up uh, that, which is like, let's see, 44, I think it would be down in this table. Um, okay, let's see, 44 is 226, right? So I think the next instruction it executes is gonna be at 226. Yep, there, so this is, so it grabbed a bytecode, got a skip pattern. See how these lines are gonna get skipped right here? And it's now executing that bytecode and see 44 is now behind the pointer. And so it looks like it's gonna grab, it's gonna get a zero. It's gonna get this, that's gonna advance. So I do next. Oh, wait, now it's gonna do it. There, the 44 moved down one. Hold on just a sec, guys. What's we do? Oh, okay, thank you, thanks a lot. So now it's executing byte codes. Every time it hits a return, let's see, here we go, boom. Okay, now here we are, we're ready. And it's gonna pick up a new byte code and execute it again. So this is your, your code running in the interpreter. Does okay, that make so, sense? So, so next isn't a, an assembly language step, it's a interpreter step. Well, it's just whatever. I mean, it, it all has to do with what you've selected here. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. just the, it's the break right now we're breaking it. We see main it says uh, this, this is going to break on every single main instruction. And since main is in spin, it's there's spin steps. Right. Yeah. So this is, I mean, everything ultimately that runs is assembly language, right? But there is this X byte mechanism that can pick up a byte and execute it by looking up a table with a jump address and a skip pattern and then jumping to that address and setting up that skip pattern. Like see here, it just got into here. Here's the skip pattern. So it's zero, 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 zero. That means it's not gonna skip where it's at. It's not gonna skip this. It's not gonna skip this, but then it's gonna skip this whole spate of instructions. So we go next, next. Next thing it's gonna be at is 230 because it's gonna skip over all that other stuff. So boom, there we are at 230 RF byte. And here, this is the actual debug, the break instruction. And it returns and gets another bytecode. So this is, I mean, if you made your own bytecode interpreter, it would look something like this. You know, you'd see it doing this. And then the other window, and let's see, where is it? Let me drag this one off here for a minute. Um, oh, I think it might be on the other screen. Hold on. Oh, got hidden behind everything else. Okay, so here's the other one. This is the cog that just has this simple little assembly language program in it. Let's see. Wait a minute, this still is the, uh, what is going on here? Let me start this over again. Uh, let's see, is this our, okay, here, here's our PASM program. This is it right here. So this thing, if we look at the code here, this is zero, right? This is one, and then it's gonna add 
one to a couple registers. It's not gonna, it's not gonna do this big delay and it's gonna jump back. If I pull this big delay out here and run this with the debugger, then, okay, here we are. So we say run main code. Wait a minute, this is not the right cog. All my windows are a little jumbled for some reason. Hold on a sec. Okay, here we go. Okay, here is our PASM program. Okay, there we are. So we, uh, whoops. So we can single step. Now, if you're writing PASM code, you're not gonna have all this crazy jumping around from byte codes, right? It's gonna be a lot more linear. So here we have a big wait instruction. When it executes, the OGD is gonna, these are gonna to execute together. So it's a long wait, it's like a one second wait. And it gave me the opportunity to break in there because I didn't know how long it was gonna take. It took over like 100 or 250 milliseconds. So it figured, okay, I don't know if it's ever coming back. So I'll give the user the option to just do an asynchronous break. And then now it's gonna execute this jump zero. It's gonna go right back up here. So if we hit next, boom, it goes there. And then this is the thing that is the debug instruction. It's gonna just skip that in this way. And it's gonna write some random, oops, there it goes. Anyway, does that all make sense? Hope I didn't put anyone to sleep. No, it seems to make sense. Okay. Yeah, so you can execute any, I mean, and you can run, uh, you know, you can debug all eight cogs at once. There's no limit because each, each cog is having its own conversation with the host PC. The only thing is if you wanna asynchronously break one cog, you gotta have some other cog that's, you know, creating routine debug interrupts so that it can be handed the request to do the async break on the other cog. But Chip. otherwise, they're all independent. What's the earliest version of Windows that will run this? Well, I have a Windows 8 machine here, um, but this is written in Delphi, like the, I think it's the, gosh, let me see, let me look. We're using an old version of Delphi. Uh, here it is. Let me, um, let's see about, so this is from 2001. So it should run on very old windows. I guess it would be compatible with at least windows 2000. And what kind of performance do you, what kind of level of system do you need to keep up with it? Oh, I don't know. I mean, not much. It's the way this thing is working. Let me try to get my window back here is I didn't use any like Windows controls, right? Because when you start using all those Windows objects, it creates all this execution with all these delays and all this stuff goes wrong. So all the only event I'm using is mouse move and mouse down in the uh, Windows API. So you see, there's a lot of stuff here that's like you don't see focus changing really, like as if you were hitting tab and you know dark outlines move around. This is all just totally raw. So I maintain a bitmap that is the screen here, and I promote that to the canvas that's visible you know on your display and all i'm all i'm doing is tracking the mouse and the mouse clicks that's it i'm drawing everything every time the mouse moves i check to see is it in this box is it in this box so these are some really simple little math queries that don't involve any kind of api calls right it's very very simple so this will run really fast i'm sure on an even very old machine because it's not stacking up all kinds of Windows events. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And so if 
is there hardware lines between the cogs so that any one can break any other one? Well, any cog can issue an asynchronous break using like an eight bit pattern. So the one bit is for each cog. Um, but the thing is they can only issue that if they themselves are in a debug interrupt. So it's kind of like this uh, alien abduction scenario where cogs in their waking mode don't know anything about debug. They cannot access it. They can't control it. They're just running user code. But once they're in debug mode, um, then they can do special things. So is, is it somewhat like supervisor mode? Yeah, you could, I think, yeah, you could call it that. It's pretty simple, but it's enough. So I made it so that nobody could like exploit debug features for any kind of runtime purpose. Now you, you can, if you want to totally forego being able to debug like this, you can use all those resources. But for normal programming, I didn't want to make it so that anybody could like, oh, there's this cool trick where if you do this, this, and then you get this, but then it blows up debugging normally. I made it so there's like a separation between them. So that when you're in the debug mode, it's like you're in the alien mothership and your conscious doesn't know what's happening, but other things can happen. Then you go back at, and, and you resume what you were doing like nothing occurred. Does that make sense? Kind of, I'm, I'm gonna just have to play with it to get my <laughs> mind wrapped around it. But it's kind of like, I think you could liken it to supervisor mode. Uh, it's just something that, you know, it's, it's separate. I mean, you're still executing instructions, of course, but uh, certain instructions do different things in debug mode than they do in normal execution mode. Just out of curiosity, uh, is there going to be documentation along with this? Because this is a fantastic debugger, but it's also kind of complicated. So some docs might be nice. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add to the uh, spin two doc. And um, yes, yeah, so I'll cover this stuff. I mean, all you got to do, you know, normally debug, you can put things like for messages, you might do something like this, right? There's all kinds of stuff. We have all these like debugging graphical windows and everything that use that that you basically use this. But if you just say debug all on its own, you, you can do that, you know, in PASM right here or in spin up here. If you just put a simple debug, it just drops you into this debugger. Actually, that was one of my questions was how, how can we access the debug tools from PASM because I'm doing most of my work in PASM, so I want to. Yeah, just just type this, okay, and awesome. if that resolves to one in, a single instruction, which is uh, let's see. Oh wait, it's here. Hold on. But what, well, what does that do with the propeller tool? Anything, or do we need Peanut uh, for that to do something? Well. So right now you need peanut because this kind of like expanded what the whole debug conversation, how it works. Um, basically when one of these, like when a debug interrupt occurs and it eventuates in updating this window, you see what happens is the first thing that gets sent out is the cog number, which is zero to seven. Well, that's an illegal ASCII character, right? I mean, it doesn't normally mean anything. It's not a printable character. So when the thing that's like, um, uh, what would you say? It's like dispatching, you know, where debug messages go. When it sees a zero to seven come in, it goes, okay, no one else is gonna know about this. This is like a quiet conversation. It doesn't wind up in this window, right? Um, but a little conversation ensues that, that's, that begins and ends in like five milliseconds, two to five milliseconds. And that is, you know, it gets all this checksum data for the hub memory. It gets all this stuff here, all this memory. And then um, it releases. So you can see that this counter is uh, still counting, right? Even though we're kind of sitting on this one instruction, it's because many debug interrupts are occurring. So if we're not stepping, if we're not doing anything like this, the PC just sends out a little command saying, okay, call me back in like 64 milliseconds because I'm waiting for the user to press a button and I don't know what he wants to do yet. So right now it just keeps giving the call back. Just get back to me in 64 milliseconds. So when those interstitial times 
all the other cogs can keep sending debug messages that might go into plot or scope windows or logic analyzer windows or whatever else. Um, but this conversation is kept, you know, off the radar of all that other stuff. And all these debug interrupts, they happen, they're, they start and end in a couple of milliseconds. So you're not like tying up anything else that needs to do any kind of debug, be it a, a, a debugger interrupt, like what you see on the screen or some kind of, um, you know, graphical debug window that's showing some data. Everything just keeps running. And by spacing them like 64 milliseconds apart and having them all take five milliseconds or less, you could have every cog doing what you see here on the screen without bumping, without taking any bandwidth from any other because 64 milliseconds over five milliseconds is almost 13, right? So eight cogs, there's still time gaps in there where nothing's happening. Does that make sense? Yep. It's designed to be like, really quick so when this debug interrupt occurs uh you don't even know that you know, what the user wants to do yet but you just update the data and if the user did click on something then it it gives that back in the next time it comes around probably because uh it doesn't wait for anything because if it, if it were to wait it could wind up holding up all the other cogs from being able to do just regular debug messaging or which would all which would translate into like an execution stall that's chip wide. But everything happens in just these little bursts. So there's lots of interstitial time for everything else to happen. You say the command um, to trigger it is debug without parentheses. Now Eric has his mic muted, but I can already hear him screaming because dear god the debug is already like giant mess to pass wait explain that say that again ada uh, just a slightly humorous comment about the pain that of passing the debug uh, statement that's the other guy he wanted to talk back about um do you mean like the like passing the, thing. the complexities eric will face if he in, it, by putting this into is that what you're talking about among other things because normally the um symbol without parentheses would be a function call but with right right with empty parentheses but... oh you're wondering how do we how are we going to give it labels i'm no i'm just just thinking because um normally if you um wait the debug of oh, the brain hurts see um, I think just having a single debug with nothing else probably isn't too bad. I guess, to I guess you could make a separate rule for debug without parentheses. I it's think already so. a keyword, right? It is, yes. Okay, so I thought it, for a second, I thought it went to the normal function call handling, which uh, I don't think it is. No, yeah. see what happens. But Look. But it, it's kind of, there's no point. Flexpin can't talk to Peanut. Like, this is all, you know. It, yeah, but it can generate a break only. zero. And what, 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 and they can load that with whatever. Well, but we don't have this debugger screen. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if it's in Peanut, you can just tell Peanut to load the compiled binary. No, that's, that would be nice if Peanut could do that. If I think Peanut it can. can. If Peanut can do what again? Load a compiled binary with a debug stub attached to it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, for your information, you see this break instruction, break pound zero? That is the debug if you're, if you're uh, in assembly language, which you would always be, Eric, right? Because everything that you're Oh, yeah, no, no. We, we can compile the debug statement into a break pound zero. That's, that's fine. The, the problem is that then we would need peanut to be able to right. load the binary that we've constructed. Right um yeah that would need to be done the code to do this isn't that long this whole debugger here is like uh let's see this is the entire debugger right whoops let's see hold on oh wait i've got 
let me get this thing all the way over. So it is, uh, this is all in Pascal or Delphi. It's all in Delphi, which yeah, would need to be translated. Yeah, so the whole thing is 2,340 lines. And of that, uh, you know, the shape, the uh, anti-alias shape drawing and line drawing, I, I put that in here, but modified it for this context. So really, aside from the shape drawing stuff, the debugger is 1,811 lines. What happens if you run a file binary with debug in it and it can't talk to peanut? That would work. I mean, if you're just loading a binary and it's going to be generating, oh, wait a minute. Okay, Eric, there is a little more we have to do. We have to have the debugger initialization stuff in there, right? We, we can compile the whole debugger, like everything. The way it works right now is that we compile the debug stub along with the user's binary to make okay. what right. downloads. So, I assume it's what Peanut probably does something similar internally. Yeah, it takes the user's binary. No, Peanut just takes, just has a pre-compiled blob and then just appends that. Um, yes. Well, it, well, it generates the table and then appends the blob. Right. Right, right. It takes the user's code and then appends to it this pre-run thing that sets up the debug. And then it runs. And then uh, when it gets these debug interrupts, these break instructions, then it jumps to the code that's in the high 16K bytes of RAM that's write protected. Yeah, so, we know how it works. You know how it, we know how it works. Yeah. The only difference, as I said, is that um, Flexbit actually compiles it at real time, which kind of causes more issues than it actually solves because it's still, because the actual source code is inside the binary, but it compiles it because reasons. Right. I think it was just the easier way to do it. Right. So this goes into special memory that COGS can't overwrite and it's not part of the hub? It's part of the hub. So the hardware uh, has, we have a megabyte of address space, right? But we only have 512K of RAM, but for but the architecture set up so that you can always take whatever the last 16K bytes of that RAM is, and you can map it to FC000 to FFFFF. You know, you can take that last 16K and it'll disappear from the end of the normal memory map, and it reappears at the very end of the full one megabyte memory map. And it can only be, once protected, it can only be written from within debug interrupts. It's like once, when the alien abduction is underway, it can be modified, but normal code cannot do anything to it. It can look at it, but it can't affect it. So if you fully load the chip, is it 512 plus 16 kilobytes in the binary? It's 512K minus 16 if you're using the debugger. Because the debugger needs that last 16K of memory to do all of its stuff in. And most of it is just buffer space. You know, for, for when you're in this context that you're seeing here, we've had to unload what was in that cog, store it in that memory, and that's 2K bytes anyway, not much. And then we had to reload in the debug program, which also has overlays that can come in. And then when we're all done, we reverse everything and restore the cog to its prior state and then do a return from interrupt zero. And then it starts back up from where it left off. In fact, if you look here, like at, at, in the reg space at the very end of memory, this is ROM code, like from one F8 to one FE. When you, the hardware jumps here, when it does it, when it do, gets a debug interrupt, see this actually saves off. Now this is not an, you can't do this in normal code. You can't say minus cog, you know, shift left seven, but this is what the hardware does on a debug interrupt. So it kind of like, dynamically saves it off to that cogs buffer. So here it saves it. 
here it reloads. Now it reloads a little 16 instruction program and then it jumps to it. And then that thing will save off the rest of the memory. And then, and then when you're finally all done and, and you've brought everything back into memory, except those first 16 locations, this cleans up those last first, last, the first 16 locations by reloading from the original save buffer. See FF80 minus COG, FF80 minus COG. It reloads and then it does this return zero. And oops. And then you're back where you left off on your program. But see, this is all instruction ROM. Notice this data here is actually like I open stuff and pointers, right? But if you were to jump here to execute, this is what your what the what the cog would execute. It wouldn't it wouldn't execute this stuff because it knows it's a data. But there's like a special eight long instruction ROM in each cog just for getting in and out of debug. And I have so, it in here so you can see it. So it's similar to pushing the whole cog's memory off to stack. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it saves Going everything. And then popping it right off the stack and then executing the next instruction. Yeah, but it's not using a stack. It's using like a, a, an area in that 16K of RAM that's been remapped to the end of the one megabyte space. It okay. uses that. And see, the thing is only one cog. Now, if you look here, we've got like two of these things running, right? We've got this one, we've got this one. Um, only one of them is actually in the debug interrupt at any given time, because it's only like max a five millisecond deal. So uh, one of these guys is using, you know, the store space to store this, right? Here's one, and then here's the other, right? So depending on who's in the inter interrupt, one of these guys is using that storage space. So when it uses the lock 15 as a semaphore to like say who gets to use the serial ports next, it also says who's going to be able to use the big buffer space, the 2K buffer that has to hold the context of the whole cog. Not the LUT. The LUT never gets touched, right? But the cog, the register space does. Does that all make sense? So when you're when you're debugging multiple cogs it flips back and forth. Yep. Yeah, this stuff switching in and out really rapidly. Okay. What, 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 uh, how many cycles does it take to go? Well, okay, so running back to the, the debuggers. It's, it's not that long, but remember, every time a debug interrupt occurs, it has to do checksums on the whole 512k minus 16k of hub RAM. So, the code that does that, I'll show you. I, I mean, I made it so it's like as quick as I as I could because tallying up 512k bytes of memory is not trivial. <coughs> it's simple, but it's uh, so here. Let's go to this code. See this code right here. So this is inside the debug code that gets loaded into the cog after the what was in there gets swapped out. So here it reads 16 locations, right? Which is 64 bytes. Then dealing with like 32 bits at a time, it, it does this stuff. So for each long, it's taking, uh, you know, this is two clocks. Each one of these is two clocks. And then it took one clock to do the block read. So three clocks per long. So it's less than like one clock per byte. So it's maybe like 384,000 ticks that have to go by just to check some of the memory. So what's that? It, it, at 300 megahertz, it's a little over a millisecond. And that's the, the check summing of memory is so that you can de detect which is changing? Yes. Yeah, so that you can, yeah. Now see, if we didn't do that, then we could save some time but there is like, we, we still also have to do uh, checksums on, oh, let's see, where'd I put it? We, we do a, a much more thorough, okay. The, the, the hub memory just gets checksummed in this kind of wonky little fashion. But for the cog, I use something a lot more strict because it's more critical. You really don't wanna be wrong about cog 
changing or not changing because critical stuff's happening. So, oh, it's, is it down here? Let's see. Where's my code that does, for the cog, we do a CRC. Let me just search for that. CRC nib. Let's see. Oh, wait, wrong focus. There we go. Yeah, so at the outset, it sends 64 CRC words for each 16 register group. And it does like a proper cyclic redundancy check, you know, using this code here. So those checks are like super thorough on the cog memory. On the hub memory, it's more kind of drive by. And so the whole process is like half a million ticks? Yeah, like probably. So probably. It's under two milliseconds? Yeah, it, yeah, it takes to do the whole debug in and out, it's two to five milliseconds. Um, and that, in, and so what happens is it first, when you first come into this deep, this debugger thing, you can, you can see right here, it's like sends off the uh, status, like, you know, what are, what's, what cog number is it? What are our special registers? Uh, what are our debug registers? And then it goes, sends off the uh, checksums for the cog registers and, and the LUT. And then it sends off the big checks, the, the simple, not CRC, but the simple checksums for the whole 512K minus 16. And then it gets the command, it gets immediately commands from the PC. And, you, and then the last thing it does is it sends back the requested register blocks, including LUT that might have changed. It sends off any 4K uh, bytes that might have changed. And it got those instructions when it received these commands here. So the idea is because USB has all these latencies, like these USB to serial thing, things have all these turnaround latencies, right? So you want to have as simple as a, of a conversation as you can, because you don't want to be saying, oh, send something to the, to the uh, prop two and then wait for the prop two to respond. And then you send something back. All those turnarounds take a lot of time because of the virtual COM port running over the uh, USB system, right? So it's just, it's just, this is all that happens. You get into a breakpoint. The P2 sends its checksums. It, then the PC sends to it its commands, which you would think are going to be out of phase, but it knows what to request for elaboration on the literal, like what's in the in the regs and the LUT, and also what are the sub checksums on the main memory, and also what do you want me to tell you about the hub memory? Because you get to query like five, you get to give it five different queries, and then uh, the 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 P2 turns around and just sends the requested data, and then it goes back to what it was doing. It gets completely back out of the debug interrupt and goes back. But it also issues like probably a, um, well, because the PC told it to issue a call me back in 64 milliseconds command. So it gets in and out really quick. Does that all make sense? It's all about minimizing the conversation and minimizing the turnarounds to like two. So it's, P2 to PC, and then PC to P2, a very short message, and then P2 to PC, whatever was requested from that exchange. And then that's done. Then it's either back running code or it's doing a 64 millisecond wait to get a call back later to find out, you know, does the user know what he wants to do yet? Can it get much simpler than that? Yeah, it, I really thought I had to really work this through thoroughly and kind of get it super ironed out and figure out everything I could do to get rid of every like contingency possible to just minimize the conversation and keep it fast, you know, fast, but complete. So that by the time this little conversation's over on your display, you have a completely up-to-date picture of what's in the registers and the LUTs, what the status of the cog is and what has changed in the uh, hub memory and updated display for whatever part of the hub memory you were looking at. It sounds like the way you wrote it, it, it 
small and, and simple, it would run even better on another propeller too. Yeah. Yeah. I would you like to, have to do, do that. The latency stuff and you could control your screen and that's interesting. How, how big is it in, in uh, as a binary? Um, you mean, okay, what runs on, on the, the Windows side? We'll say that again. How big is the Windows binary just to do the uh, debug stuff? Oh, you know, I don't know, but the entire um, application, let me see here. Let's, let's ask it. Uh, it's less than a megabyte. It and could be like 300 K bytes if we could use a compressor, but these days Windows flips out if it sees compressed code because it thinks it's some kind of a virus or something. What about the, the stuff in the, uh, in the P2? Like how much of a overhead does Peanut require or does it require any? Is that it working just well, on Well, Peanut doesn't require any overhead, but the debugger does. So the debugger uh, sits, well, look here. I got a little map here in the top of my code. If we go back to this. So this is the, uh, this is the code. See, it says spin2 debugger.spin2. So if we go to the top of this thing, here's the memory map. So this is the memory setup, right? For the last 16K. So uh, this here is the, is the, is the buffer that will hold like the whole cog memory or the whole register space. Here's where the actual debugger sits and it has some overlays. I should put in here like uh, debugger plus overlays plus data. So what happened was I, the debugger didn't fit all in the cog at once. So I made an overlay area where I can just bring in stuff from the other part of of this memory right here, right? Between here and here. There's, I don't know how much, I mean, what is, uh, what is, well, I can do the math here. Let's see, and pull up a calculator. Uh, whoops. All right, we'll go to programmer. So we're like uh, F, well, basically let's take the lower digits here. Oh wait, let's go to hex. COO minus one uh, AO is that, and then in decimal, it's about two point. Well, let's see. Divide by one oh two four. Oh, this thing truncates the fraction, so it's like probably two and a half k or something. It's not much, but see here are all the little storage areas, right? Like when an interrupt occurs, like when cog zero. When a debug ISR occurs, it, it saves the first 16 registers here and then loads a program into those registers from here. And then that program saves everything off, saves all the big stuff off to here. And then it loads in this stuff with overlays and then it reverses everything when it's done. And then this business up here from from there to there, uh, C, D, E, A, that's about 11K or so, 10K. That's all the debug stuff for like debug windows. That's nothing to do with the debugger, but it's, it's all the data for like debug display windows, like plot and scope and uh, bitmap, all, all that kind of business winds up in here. And that's like more or less textual data. But this stuff all, see, when the debugger gets attached to your app, all this stuff gets squirreled away in that top 16K and it gets protected. And then only on debug interrupts does it get accessed and can it be rewritten. So as far as the user program knows, the only thing he knows aside from missing time, if he's paying attention, is that uh, he doesn't have, six, the last 16K of RAM is gone, doesn't exist anymore. He can read it, but he can't write it. No, actually, from, from his address space, it will disappear. He can see it at the end of memory. Like if we go to here, right, and we go, I can, 
there. So there. So this is this is the beginning. This is where the 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 distilled you know debug stuff winds up for all your debug statements. And then there's it was at f. What was that address? Uh, f f one a o. That's where the that's where the uh, that's where the code begins. So ff one ao if we go to here. There. There's there's where the stuff sits that gets loaded into the cog on a debug interrupt. And if I click on this here, boom, now we can see it up here. So this is the debug code right here. But no one using the debugger really needs to know. I mean, I'm, I like talking about it. I like it. But in practice, nobody would even really need to know this or maybe care about it. You know, but that's just how it works under the hood. Does it still use 63 and 62 for transmit and receive? Yes. So it's inner, it's multiplexed or whatever with the. Uh, Yes, it's time multiplexed. What? How does that affect what you set baud rate to? Um, well, the faster the baud rate, the shorter the conversations get. So, uh, the only thing that would happen if you set a lower baud rate is it would take longer to, you know, every every conversation would take longer. So, so that you, would you just slow things down. I think it's all it would do. It wouldn't cause anything to not work. So your two to five milliseconds is uh, dependent on what, what baud rate, two, like two megabits? Yeah, that's at like, yeah, now two to five milliseconds is at two megabaud. And then right now I'm running the chip at 300 megahertz. So it would stretch out if you went to like 200 megahertz, it would get a little bit longer, you know, because aside the comm times are static at two megabaud, but the time to calculate the CRCs and the checksums in the hub memory, that's all some, that's all variable and it, it doesn't always fit within the timing for the communication. So it can stretch it out a little bit. What's the fastest serial port uh, from P2 to P2 have you seen? You will, okay, well, from P2 to P2, it could be like tens of megahertz, but from the PC, uh, two megabaud is like the, it can do three, but but it's touchy. And, and I, I think I was playing with three by cutting down the, the uh, latency. Let me pull up, let me pull up the uh, device manager on my machine here. And let's see, so, what you need to do to, to cut those, remember I said the turnarounds in the conversation take a lot of time? Yeah. Uh, let's see, advanced. Okay, so this is the USB, this is the FTDI thing, right? Go in here. Now, this is the big deal. This latency timer is normally set to 16 milliseconds. That means that anytime you turn the conversation around, you suffer a 16 millisecond delay because the PC is just not going to be looking fast enough. But it's all set up between this buffer size and this thing that at two megabaud, everything works. But to go to three megabaud, you absolutely have to cut this thing down. But I was finding that at three megabaud, it wasn't really that there was still some unreliable things going on, even with the latency cut down to one millisecond. But I'm not remembering. My, Jeff at work, we were, we were talking about this, but I just remember thinking that we just need to stick at two megabods because three is uh, it's not reliable and it can't really be made to be reliable. And the funny thing is, if you use the API that FTDI gives you, all it does is puts this under API control. It doesn't give you any lower level access than you still have to set like the latency timer and you still set the buffer sizes. 
you know, I was thinking that the API would let you really get underneath things, but you're still basically stuck with the same settings you have just configuring the serial port under the advanced settings, you know, which is right here. You don't get anything extra. Does that all make sense? Yeah, I, but so, so why why did you develop this on a PC and not on a P2 itself? Well, I like that's what I want to do is go to a PC because I mean, excuse me, to the P2 itself because it's going to be really cool to be able to write software that never breaks again because the the PC is always a moving target and over the years, you know, you can't even give someone an executable anymore because their antiviral software will scare them away from running your code telling them it's probably some kind of Trojan horse or something. So it'd be really nice to get away from all that, but it would mean that the person would have to plug in monitors directly to the P2 and keyboard and mouse. It's not a big deal. I mean, I have that on my desk, but I'd have to have it shareable between my PC and the P2. It's basically making a P2 Raspberry Pi. Yeah, yeah. It'd be fun. I mean, I could write all, I could take the whole compiler and put, write everything in spin two and make it all work. And, and, and then going forward, we could just make a spin two interpreter in C that could then run the whole compiler on any platform. All you got to do is compile in C the spin two interpreter, you know, without the IO commands, just the memory movement stuff. And then some kind of thing for file IO. So you that are that are asking, you would you would like to work on a P2 and not on the PC? Yeah, I hate PCs. Say that again. I hate them because there's they're, they're too complex. But like you said, they move around. I, I don't I don't run Windows typically. I run Linux. But even oh. that, you know. But even even Linux is a pain. You're saying. Yeah, you got you've got libraries that constantly are updating, and you know, I want to be able to pull out 10 year 10 year old hardware 10 years from now yes yeah just running yeah that's that's what we've always thought to it it would sure be nice to be able to go back to a system years later and you pull up the same exact working environment it's super snappy and quick and you don't lose anything to this whole metamorphosis that's ongoing with bigger systems uh, on the other hand, though, I mean, for software development, you know, I love Git and having, you know, all the, the high level development tools. So th there's an argument for both sides or both ways. Right. right. There is. And who knows? Maybe we could make a Git interface. The thing is, this is a new thing. Windows used to be good, believe it or not. But at some point, they fired their QA department. And since then, all the programs start. I don't know. That's our. I, 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 I've been a Linux user for a long time, and Windows, even since back to Windows ninety five, uh, has been sort of a weird contraption. I mean, ninety five a bit is a bit funny because it's basically just a DOS shell, but it kind of like eats the DOS from inside out because the DOS drivers are like really slow because they can't because they're never re entrant. So it kind of eats the DOS drivers from the inside out. It copies it like hacks them to disable them and then use its own drivers very bizarre this uh, operating system but nt actually works good used to work good before they fucked it up now we have funny issues where apis randomly stop working and just, just the computer randomly upgrades itself to a new operating system and uh, like the computer randomly refuses to run your binary because it thinks it's not secure i i like, Living in Windows is like living in an apartment. Being in Windows is like being in an apartment building where you know the landlord hates you and he's eventually going to kick you out. Just a I mean, I'm still process. I'm still using Windows Seven on this. It's it's like especially if you take into account the video capture hardware, which that's barely supported by Windows Seven because when Windows Seven came out, analog TV was on the out, so was on the way out. Um, then it, it runs the drivers on Windows 7, and the whole machine is uh, an AM4 machine with um, a Ryzen CPU, which itself barely supports Windows 7. It's like extremely funny setup that I have. If you're, if I you're, don't know. Sorry, I was just gonna say, Chip, if you're looking, if you're looking for um, 
uh, suggestions or, or things that that could help people. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a very experienced assembly language programmer, but I'm, I'm just basically starting to get into uh, electronics. And the whole, the whole thing about the P2 is completely fascinating, especially like the smart pins and the, lo the, the different logic modes and stuff. But the big thing holding me back is documentation and, and um, just being able to move forward with different projects. Like for example, there's in the, in the propeller tool, um, there's, <clears throat> there's that uh, chord program that you or the chorus program that you wrote that lets you speak into a microphone and, then, and provide MIDI information and it, and it does something. But I have a headset with a microphone that uh, even with the AV module, the microphone is, it, it's apparently not reading it or something. I don't know, I don't know why. Uh... And, and also with the MIDI, uh, you mentioned, you know, using MIDI and there's a MIDI pin uh, input, but when I look at the MIDI pinouts, there's two MIDI uh, data. There's a plus and a minus. So I, I don't even know how to wire up my MIDI port oh. to, to work. So a more full, like fully functioning and working examples for the different features would be super useful as a, as a start, as a launching point to, you know, getting people into the project, especially like me, if they're kind of new to things and they, they want to break into this. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, let me see about the MIDI being, it's a, it's a dual, it's a dual signal, differential signal thing, but there's a little board I bought, uh, I'm on Amazon. Let me see if I can find it. MIDI interface board. Here we go. Let's see. Chip, Chip, yeah. as we are moving into general discussion, shall I stop the recording and we pause this part and then we just open discussion? Uh, sh sure, yeah. All right. Ah, uh, here's, uh, let's see. <clears throat> 